Okay, we are live. And we are just waiting for people to join us. See, there's some people coming in. Welcome, welcome, everybody. We're going to give this just a few minutes before we uh, kick things off here. I see people are still coming in. Welcome everybody. All right, we got folks even joining us from Canada. That's great. All right, we're just giving this just a minute before we kick off because uh, we want to give people time to join. All right, hello everybody. We're going to give this just another minute or two. All right, this is great. I see a lot of people joining the call. Welcome everyone. We are uh, just waiting a minute or two before we get started to let more people join in. Great. Welcome, welcome everybody that's joining. All right, uh, so we can go ahead and start moving along. There's gonna be a lot more people joining the call. Um, so hi everybody, uh, thanks for joining the call tonight. My name is Chris Brooks. I am a member of UAW Local 1981, the National Writers Union, and I'm a staff writer and organizer with Labor Notes. Um, I'm gonna be facilitating the call this evening. I really appreciate everyone joining us. Um, while people are still joining on, while we're still waiting, I'm just going to take a minute just to tell everyone a little bit about Labor Notes. Uh, so Labor Notes is a media and organizing project that has been around for over 40 years. Uh, through our magazine and website, books, conferences, and workshops, we promote organizing, aggressive strategies to fight concessions, and unions that are run by their members. Uh, so Labor Notes is also a network of rank-and-file union members who are fighting to make our unions more democratic and more militant. We've supported multiple groups of auto workers in the past as they've organized to take on the boss and the union leaders that have failed them. Uh, that includes locals opposed to concessions, the New Directions Movement, Soldiers of Solidarity, Auto Workers Caravan, and now Unite All Workers for Democracy, or UAWD. One of our biggest projects at Labor Notes is our big national conference, which is held every two years in Chicago. It's the largest conference in the world of rank and file union activists from across all industries and unions. In 2018, so two years ago, we had over 3,000 attendees and over 200 workshops and panels on everything from how to run for union office to how to organize a strong contract campaign to the legal rights of union stewards. Uh, so it's a whole mix of things. Our next conference is coming up in April. It's April 17th to the 19th, and I hope you'll consider coming. Uh, you can find out more by visiting our website. There's going to be many UAWD members there, uh, which we're very excited about, as well as folks who have been involved in past efforts to reform the UAW. So that uh, brings us to why we're here tonight. Uh, so the United Auto Workers was once known for being one of the cleanest unions in the country. That is obviously no longer the case. A multi-year federal investigation into the auto industry has exposed far-reaching corruption and self-dealing by union leaders and corporate management. To date, three Chrysler executives, seven union officials, and the widow of a deceased UAW vice president have all been convicted of crimes uncovered by the investigation. Two others are currently indicted and awaiting trial. And the investigation is now closing in on both former UAW president Dennis Williams and former president Gary Jones. In October, allegations emerged that uh, Jones 
and other senior UAW officials had embezzled over one and a half million dollars of union dues money, it's our money, uh, out of the union to finance their own lives of luxury. So this is a moment of really deep crisis for the UAW. Uh, the UAW must act boldly if it hopes to restore its credibility and to avoid a, a government takeover under the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO. Sadly, the UAW's leadership's uh, response to date has been entirely inadequate. For example, the union leaders only began taking steps to bring charges against Jones after multiple local unions across the country passed resolutions demanding such charges be brought. So for anyone who's paying attention, the message is pretty clear. If the UAW is gonna get cleaned up, if concessions and corruption are going to come to an end, then it's the members that are gonna to have to lead the way. Thankfully, a national movement of rank and file auto workers called Unite All Workers for Democracy, or UAWD, is organizing to transform our union from the bottom up. And one of their goals is to push for a specially called national convention to amend the union's constitution and mandate that its top leaders be elected by a direct vote of the members. So to discuss the, UAD, the UAWD and the, the fight for member-led reform, I'm joined on this call by four other UAW activists. Uh, so uh, joining me is retired New Directions activist, Michael Cannon. Hello. Uh, I'm also joined by Scott Holdison, a member of Local 551 at the Ford Chicago Assembly Plant. Hi, everyone. Uh, also joining us is Travis Watkins, a member of Local 167 at the Caravan Facility in Michigan. Hey, everybody. And lastly, we're happy to have uh, Kenneth LaRue, a member of Local 1853 at the GM plant in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Hello, everyone. Uh, so the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna go around and ask each of our panelists a question, uh, but at the end, I'm gonna be taking questions from you, the audience. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, there's a Q&A function in the Zoom app down at the bottom where you can type in your questions and I'll be pulling from those as we go on. So please feel free during the call to just type in any questions that you have as they come up to you and we'll be circling back to them later. Uh, so the first question is gonna to go to Mike Cannon. Uh, Mike, uh, you were, you know, member-led reforms have a long and proud history in the UAW. Uh, one of those efforts was the New Directions Movement, um, which tried to steer the UAW away from labor management partnership and concessions towards democracy and militancy. Um, as a former leader in the New Directions movement, can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, that, that movement and why you believe one member, one vote is an important step in reforming the union? Well, it, the history of the New Directions movement starts in 1986. Uh, members in uh, UAW Region 5 were just uh, frustrated with the level of leadership they were receiving from the regional director, who was Ken Worley at the time. Uh, Jerry Tucker was his assistant. And uh, the basis of their frustration was due to the fact that Ken Burley, he held the position, but he never performed any of the functions of the regional director. Uh, he wasn't involved in collective bargaining. He wasn't involved in the politics of the union. Uh, whereas Jerry Tucker, as his assistant, was fighting out in the field, fighting concessions uh, in many local unions. Um, he was involved in the political process and also or trying to organize in the region as well. So the contrast between those two individuals was pretty stark. And the leadership and the membership of Region 5 got together. They formed this new direction movement. And they went to Jerry Tucker and asked him to run against the incumbent, Ken Worley, as regional director. Um, this was, as I said, was in 1986. So. Tucker finally agreed to run, to run for regional director. And at the UAW convention in Anaheim, California in 86, the election was held. Tucker lost by two tenths of a vote. Um, we found out on the same day that there were some election irregularities on the part of the administration caucus. Uh, a couple of delegates voted at the convention who had not been duly elected under the terms of the Constitution. So we filed an appeal through the UAW election process and ultimately filed a complaint with the Department of Labor and they agreed to take up our case, went to court, judge ordered a new election. And in 1988, we had a rerun of that election and Tucker won 
the regional director spot in Region 5. Uh, sadly, we, he was only in office nine months because it took two years to process this whole case through the courts. And uh, in 1989, he was up for re-election. Unfortunately, he lost the election for regional director of Region 5, um, as well as Downey Douglas, who was running to unseat the incumbent in UAW Region 1, who was uh, Bob Lynn at the time. Uh, Downey Douglas also lost his race. Uh, but new directions continue to stay around and discuss the questions and debate the questions of jointness in the UAW democracy in the UAW, the one member, one vote, they, they uh, embodied that cause as well. Um, and in 1992, Tucker ran against Owen Bieber for president of the UAW. Now, most people say, well, you know, he ran against Owen Bieber. He only received about 5% of the vote from the delegates doing, do, through the UAW convention system. But it was a symbolic gesture to try to break the mindset, the culture of the UAW that had existed as just a one party state at, at that point. Um, so that's the basic history, the short version of what happened in Region 5 and how New Directions was born. Um, like I said, you know, the whole question of jointness was, uh, was big on our agenda. We, did, we just simply felt that it was not in the interest of workers to collaborate with management, join management in essence, because as Tucker used to always say, there is a stark difference between labor and capital and their goals and aspirations are not the same. And they're always going to be a conflict with each other. Um, you know, of course, capital is more concerned about making more capital and workers are more interested in trying to uh, redistribute the wealth in, in, in the country and provide for their families through having, you know, high paying jobs and the like. Uh, so that's the brief history of, of uh, Re Region 5 New Directions, which somewhat became somewhat national when uh, uh, Donnie Douglas and, uh, uh, and others joined in with New Directions to try to change the union. Yes. Uh, now, why is one member one vote important? Well, it would be the first time that the membership of the union would have an opportunity to select their own leadership. As it stands right now, we have the administration caucus, which the leadership of the administration caucus and the international executive board are the same people. And they basically decide who's going to run for president, vice president, and regional directors all throughout the country. Um, going to a system where one member, one vote takes that, deep, that centralized power and distributes it to the membership, allows them to select the, meet, the leaders that they deem to be qualified and who will also advocate a worker's agenda as opposed to leaving that in the hands of just a few people who are only doing it to serve themselves. Their whole goal is simply to get reelected time and time again. And once they're elected to these positions, they basically stay in them until they decide to retire. And there's no way to unseat them if they're not performing their, their job, or as in the case that we have now, where they engage in corruptive practices. So that's the reason that we have to do this. It has to move to that. There are other unions that have direct election of their officers, and the UAW should be no exception to that. Thanks, Mike. And can you just say very briefly, um, if you had been able to elect other people than the administration caucus to the executive committee, do you think that would have had an impact on the corruption that we now see has been rampant in the union? Exactly, because when you go to at least a two-party system, and no one knows how many caucuses will come out of this, it could be three or four parties, but when you have at least a two-party system, one party can always investigate and question the actions and the practices of the other party. You know, similar to the situation we have in Congress now, they will always be able to bring up and question and, and check and act, act as a check and balance, balance against the majority party in power. 
And I saw some of that when Tucker became the regional director. That was like the first time in recent history we ever had a member from an opposing caucus that also have a seat on the International Executive Board. And when we would go to those meetings, Tucker would be the one who would bring up discussions about jointness and our reason and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the fact that we needed to end that. We needed to get away from that. Uh, and just his presence in the room had a chilling effect on a number of things that Owen Beaver and the vice presidents and other regional directors wanted to do. Uh, so having an opposing party on the International Executive Board acts as a check and balance against the power of the majority without, without question. And I would envision that if we had more than a one party system in the UAW today, the corruption that we see now would never have been, uh, would, would never have come forward because there's no way that anyone could engage in corrupt practices uh, because they would have been exposed by, you know, the other party, the minority party in this case. So yes, definitely, definitely, uh, definitely would have changed the culture of the UAW and allowed for uh, another check on unbridled power. And that's what we have right now. Thank you very much. That's very insightful. Uh, all right, so next we're going to turn to Scott Holdison. Uh, Scott, you're a founding member of the Unite All Workers for Democracy movement, um, or UAWD. You also wrote the Article 8 resolution that is now being currently passed by locals around the country. Uh, so can you explain to everyone on the call what uh, UAWD is and what this resolution says and does and how it becomes a pathway to a special convention to discuss uh, the question of, of direct elections? Sure, I'd be happy to uh, talk about all that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Chris, and, and Labor Notes for putting on this webinar. Uh, this is an important vehicle for, for us to get a message out to, uh, to, to our members. Um, UAWD, or Unite All Workers for Democracy, uh, is a, a movement of rank and file UAW members uh, who are concerned about uh, the, the direction our, our union has been taking. And we are interested in enacting uh, reforms. Uh, and the reforms to the UAW that we'd like to see enacted are democratic reforms, um, transparency reforms. And we are hoping that through those kind of reforms, we can get accountability uh, to uh, over our uh, international officers. Uh, the problem has been that uh, with a one-party state like Mike was talking about, uh, there is nobody to hold them accountable. Uh, and, you know, they, they've uh, been very, uh, feeling very comfortable uh, in getting involved with these schemes uh, uh, that have really hurt the, the members of the UAW. How, how has it hurt the members? It has hurt the members by uh, giving us poorer contracts when the uh, the head negotiator for Fiat Chrysler is paying off the last two vice presidents uh, over that department um, to you know grease the skids for better contract terms for for Fiat Chrysler it hurts the members um, also uh, you know when we started seeing these uh, indictments and things coming out, uh, you know, we, we were concerned. And then, and then when it started hitting our uh, membership dues, uh, a bunch of us got together and decided that we wanted to look into the constitutional options that we had available to us. So the first constitutional option that we exercised was the Article 30, uh, Section 1B. And that option allows members to file charges uh, against uh, international officers. And that's what we did. You mentioned that briefly, Chris. Uh, um, Chris Budnick down in uh, uh, Kentucky at Local 862 actually was the one that got uh, uh, the affidavit filed and uh, he got the, uh, his local to endorse it, then six other local or five other locals endorsed it. And uh, 
at that point, the International Executive Board decided they had to do something. They stepped in and filed their charges. Uh, you asked about the resolution. The resolution is aimed at bringing a uh, one member, one vote system to the union. But there's a process in our constitution that must be followed to do that. Uh, and that process is pretty detailed laid out in the constitution in article eight, section four. Uh, and there, in article eight, section four, there's a, a two different ways to call a special convention. One, the International Executive Board can do it. Two, the membership can do it. Uh, but in order to do that, you need to have uh, 15, at least 15 different locals in five different states representing 20% of the total membership of the UAW. Um, so that's actually a pretty heavy lift to get that done. Then once that done gets done, it triggers a referendum vote of the uh, uh, the entire membership of the UAW. Um, and uh, if a majority of the members want the uh, special convention convened, then the uh, International Executive Board and, uh, is obligated to do so. Um, it, it also says that you need to have specific purpose for the, uh, the convention. So, you know, we encourage locals that pass a, a resolution calling for a special convention to pass the same resolution because we want to be united in our purpose. And our purpose uh, is to uh, bring, uh, change the way we elect our international officers. We want direct elections, a direct referendum election of our international executive board, uh, all the positions. Uh, we also want transparency. Uh, the resolution asks for um, uh, regular financial reports to be uh, published and uh, so that all the members can see it and also easier access to the uh, minutes of the executive board meetings so we understand their decision making processes. Uh, it also uh, uh, wants to undo a something that was passed at the last convention where the, uh, the officers, the International Executive Board's uh, chase, <laughs> my dog's drinking. Um, the International Executive Board, uh, their salaries are now tied to the salaries of the international uh, servicing representatives who they negotiate those, those salaries with. So, you know, when they agree to a, an increase in, in salary for the, uh, servicing reps, they, inter uh, <laughs> they agree to a uh, increase in salary for themselves. So uh, we'd like to see that disconnected. Um, so it, the Constitution says you have to have a specific date uh, or a specific uh, location and uh, time, day for the uh, uh, special convention. And that's, that's included in the resolution. Also, it says uh, you have to request when the ballots are supposed to be mailed out for this re referendum vote. Uh, that's also included in the, in the uh, resolution. Uh, right now, we're facing a pretty tight time frame. Uh, the ballots, according to the, this resolution, are supposed to be mailed out by February 21st, which means that uh, we really need to uh, get the requisite number of uh, uh, members, locals representing 20% uh, of the membership uh, on board and pass uh, by Valentine's Day, essentially, so that, you know, there's time to make up the, those ballots and, and uh, make sure that everything is uh, sealed up and done. Did that answer your questions? It did. I, I do have a follow up though. Um, so uh, two questions. How many locals have passed this resolution already? You said that there's a steep hill to climb. How close are we to reaching the top of that hill? And how can anyone who's interested find a copy of the resolution to have it passed in their local? Oh, great questions. Um, 12 locals have passed it so far. Uh, the Constitution requires a minimum of 15 locals to pass it. 
but uh, the highest hurdle is, is the 20% of the, the membership. So right now that's right in the neighborhood of 80,000 members. So uh, the 12 locals that have passed it, they represent uh, roughly 34 to 35,000 members. So we're almost at the halfway point uh, for the uh, number of members. Um, so we're gonna keep working at it and uh, keep doing outreach. Uh, that's partly what this webinar is for, is outreach. Um, and uh, your second question? Where they can find a copy of the resolution. Oh, yeah. Uh, UAWD.org. Uh, that's uh, uh, Unite All Workers for Democracy website. And uh, right there on the, the front page, there's a, a button, a link you can click on. It'll take you to instructions on how to, uh, how to present it, what needs to be done. And there's a link to the resolution and also to a toolkit uh, to try and help you uh, get do the outreach in your local union. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Scott. That was very Thank you. Um, all right. So, uh, Travis, I want to go to you next. Um, so you also are a founding member of the UAWD and um, have passed the Article 8 resolution uh, calling for a special convention in your own local. So can you tell us why it's important for everyone on this call to one, join uh, you know, Unite All Workers for Democracy or UAWD, and two, how they can follow your example in passing the resolution in their own locals? Okay, well, let me first, uh, I'll start out by thanking uh, you, Chris, and uh, Labor Notes for hosting the webinar and uh, giving us this opportunity to speak to our membership and to those who are joining us and uh, interested in learning more about the UAWD. Uh, start with your question. Uh, you know, the ability or inability uh, to organize is the success or failure of any movement, okay? And that's no different for us here. Um, you know, uh, I came across a quote today of Dr. King's, and forgive me, I can't remember the entire quote, but the, the part that I remember was, to produce change, people must organize working together in units of power. That power is our membership, and uh, that's you and I. Um, the UAWD movement uh, has the potential to be that organized change. Uh, we need that dedicated commitment uh, from our membership to stand with us. Um, the UAWD is a principled movement. Uh, we believe we have an organized path to restore the power back to the membership. Uh, never forget that the membership is uh, the ruling body of our union. And, uh, but without this organization and a solid front by our membership, uh, the administration caucus and the international leadership uh, will not view any reform effort as a serious threat. Uh, we need to uh, restore the power and accountability back to the rank and file and it's where it's always intended to be, where it is now, and it's just time to organize that power. Um, so we need you, and that's why I'm asking for uh, my union brothers and sisters to, uh, to join with our movement. Um, re regarding uh, Article 8, um, like Scott had mentioned, um, uh, the UAW website, uh, again, uh, uawd.org, has a fantastic template and toolkit available to help prepare anybody that's interested in bringing it to their membership. Uh, it's no different uh, from the one that I use successfully in bringing to my membership uh, meeting. Uh, you know, solidarity starts on the shop floor. And so the best advice that I can give to those that are bringing the resolution or interested in bringing it to the membership is to, to start there. Uh, engage your local members prior uh, to the membership meeting. Uh, make sure you have uh, support and someone there to second your motion. Um, you know, I know we all don't have the time on the shop floor to have lengthy conversations. And so what I did was I, I took a, took uh, some time and I wrote a few paragraphs and I attached it to the, a copy of the resolution. And I, you know, I approached the membership that I know that attend the membership meetings. Uh, and I passed those out and gave them an opportunity to sit with that uh, and think about it and contemplate it. And I think that's important. Um, that's who's voting, you know, um, but 
you know, also don't be afraid to approach uh, the members who don't actively attend the membership meetings. Uh, you know, many of our members, as you know, are uh, disenfranchised with the, the corruption and uh, this issue may be something they've been looking for, you know, and, and there's support there as well. Um, prepare for opposition. Uh, don't be intimidated by those attempts to shut you down. Uh, anticipate what the opposition might say. Be prepared to have some answers available for those. Um, again, I think preparation is the key prior to the meeting. Uh, and ask those that you know that are going to support your the, the resolution to uh, stand and speak in, in favor of the motion if they feel comfortable to do so. That's great, Travis. And, and was there any um, particular lessons from what you did that you think uh, you didn't know going into it that you wish you had known? If you could talk to yourself before you tried to pass the resolution, what would you say? You know, I think I, I probably would have spent a little bit more time role playing the 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 opposition, what what uh, what they're going to bring, what they're going to say, and spent some more time uh, preparing to have really good, solid answers. I think I was able to. I did my best, and uh, we were successful. Um, but it was difficult. We did have a lot of opposition, and I think people need to understand that there is going to be some opposition. Um, but, you know, the membership is ultimately going to decide, and um, it's there, so. Great. Thank you so much. But, um, so I see that some people are already beginning to ask questions, which is fantastic. Uh, I would just encourage everybody on the call, if you have questions, to enter them in the Q&A or the chat function, and I'll um, be pulling from those very soon. Um, so next, we're going to be hearing uh, from Kenneth LaRue. Uh, Kenneth is um, at a large local in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and uh, he was um, able to work with his coworkers there to pass the resolution over the objections of his own local president. So anticipating some of the opposition we might be uh, facing as we go out to try to reform our, our union. Um, so Kenneth, what advice do you have for activists uh, who are trying to, to pass this resolution and, and knowing that they might face uh, some pushback from their local leadership? Oh uh, well, yeah, thanks. I, I'd like to, uh, like everybody else, thanks, thank, uh, thank everybody that's uh, that's watching and everybody that's uh, on this podcast, and thank you, Chris. Uh, but what you know, I, I think uh, Travis kind of hit the nail on the head uh, when he said bring support. Uh, you know, it was a large local, and I knew ahead of time that that some of our leadership uh, wasn't on board. And, and I think that's part of the process, but I'll get the, to that uh, in a minute. Um, so the first thing uh, is, is bring support. Uh, and you gotta, you gotta foster that and build it. Uh, luckily at my local, we have a, a very uh, prominent uh, kind of Facebook community. A lot of people uh, are comfortable on Facebook. Uh, and it was used a lot during the strike, so people were already active. Uh, so I used that. Uh, you know, one thing I did was uh, uh, a, a week or a couple weeks before, uh, I would post things on Facebook like, uh, you know, now's the time. Uh, you know, uh, if you want to change, we gotta, we got to act now. Uh, and, and we have a voice, and we need to use it. And, and just little things like that. Uh, and I let people know ahead of time, I actually uh, copied the uh, uh, amendment or the Article 8 uh, document that we're looking to pass and posted that. You know, let everybody know that this is what's coming. Uh, and then I got a lot of communication from Facebook and, and, and it went uh, really well. Uh, but the point is, to have, make sure you have support at that meeting and as much as possible. Uh, and and, and that, that, that's really important. And, and what, where I found anger uh, uh, to help was there's a lot of people at our local that are coming uh, down south and they're, they're kind of encountering uh, a little more harsh work environments than we're, we're used to up north. Uh, but there's anger, there's other anger. Uh, you know, a lot of people are just, mad at the corruption going on you know maybe not everybody got their temps hired 
uh, some some locals are some locals are running into to problems uh, so you need to find that uh, and kind of turn it into support on on the uh, on the floor at the meeting uh, and the other thing is let leadership know ahead uh, especially now time's getting short uh, I think it's that it's really important that you don't uh, just show up with that document in hand, read it, uh, and expect good results. Uh, you have to have support, and it's a good idea to let leadership know ahead what's coming. But if you don't, uh, they have the ability to call you out of order or to uh, table or motion, and if that happens, uh, you know, it, it delays things. So you want to make sure you give them a heads up. Uh, and let them know what's coming. If if you don't want to, you don't want to scare them into uh, trying to stall this. So uh, the other thing I wanted to get into is kind of the nuts and bolts of uh, the actual meeting. Uh, it, as long as those things are planned and laid out ahead, uh, you have support. You got uh, the leadership knows ahead. Uh, you're going to walk into that meeting. Uh, ready to go uh, uh, with 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 support um, in new business when the, when the, when the president's uh, reading his section which is usually at the, the start of the meeting uh, he'll ask for new business that's when you want to present uh, you know I did a quick intro I, I said basically uh, this is a uh, uh, article 8 uh, document uh, that calls for a special convention uh, to enact one member, one vote, and uh, the other the few things that the, that the document entails. Uh, and when you stand up to the mic, you know, I always say, uh, Mr. President, I want to make a formal motion in good order. Uh, kind of sets the tone. And I'll just read that, read that document uh, verbatim. Uh, you'll need somebody to second you. Uh, and at that point, the president will open the floor for comments. Um, we got, I'm going to kind of give you some, a few examples of the arguments we had. Uh, uh, Travis kind of mentioned to kind of role play and get this uh, uh, right ahead of time, which was really good advice. Uh, but I think, I, I think most of the arguments are going to come down uh, to very simple arguments. I think primarily you're going to have uh, people that uh, are arguing for the status quo, uh, my president did that. Uh, you know, his arguments were basically the the the, the uh, you know the the few bad apples argument <laughs> that that uh, they are fixing things. Uh, and and you know the the he read Rory Gamble's uh, list of things that he was going to uh, address, and that, uh, right after he became president. Um, and the other thing he said was that if we if 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 we don't fix this, the government will. So you're going to get arguments that 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 things are already kind of in the works, or uh, you know why fix something that isn't broken. Uh, to me, these are terrible arguments, but that's what you're, a lot of people are going to receive. And I think it's because uh, people are, have for years been conditioned. Uh, to vote for the status quo in our, our organization. And there was fear uh, involved in that because we, you know, we're kind of worried about future products and things like that. And that's the kind of thing that was always held over our head. But uh, you know, my argument uh, against that is that uh, twofold. A, if we just sit back as a membership and do nothing, uh, what kind of message does that send uh, to the public? Uh, and it's unethical. Uh, you know, this is our union. Uh, this is something we should be uh, fighting. You know, we need to own it. Uh, and, and we want the public to see that, that we are sitting back letting this happen. They need to see that we're disgusted and we're taking action and we're doing what we need to do to fix things. Uh, and the other part of that is, uh, if, if we can enact one member, one vote, uh, there's going to be less uh, influence that the administrative caucus can uh, 
can have on on that election. Uh, and with with a more direct tether, uh, we can hold them more accountable. Uh, and that's the thing that we need we need the administrative caucus to know that we, the rank and file, the people on the floor, are watching them, and they need to know that we're not going to put up with this. And uh, so that's kind of the, the, some of the points I made. Uh, I, another guy came up and said that, uh, you know, that the UAW is no longer a majority, uh, or the auto workers are no longer, sorry, I said that wrong. The auto workers are no longer a majority of the UAW, which has some truth, but uh, the other side of that is uh, we are the largest uh, membership and it doesn't really matter. You know, we need qualified good people uh, to be representing us. And, and, and you know what, uh, I don't see that as a major issue uh, where they're selected from. Uh, and, and, you know, that, to me, that seems like a pretty ridiculous argument. Uh, the other thing we had was uh, delegates, uh, somebody argued that the delegate system is, is working fine. Uh, you know, I would caution people uh, to on the counter arguments not to call people out. Uh, you got to be careful with this one because we don't want to say uh, this person was elected a delegate and they got out there and they uh, did everything the administrative caucus caucus wanted them to do and uh, didn't represent the people on the floor. We, you know, we got to remember that we don't want to call out brothers and sisters. Uh, and really, it's just about keeping the focus on uh, the system, you know. So, I mean, we can argue that and say, well, we all know that there is, uh, that, that in the past delegates have been influenced uh, and we need to get rid of that uh, influence. Uh, that's a good argument, but we've got to be careful about calling people out. Uh, so that's primarily uh, what we had in my meeting. Uh, what what you'll need to do is after uh, after there's discussion, somebody will have to either get in line, depending on how your local works. Some some people get in line behind a microphone. Some people raise their hands and the microphone gets passed around. But after your uh, you've read your motion, uh, got your second, uh, you've had your your comments. Someone will have to call for a vote, uh, and you have to do that pretty specifically. You have to say, I got to call. I'm calling a calling the vote on uh, ratifying the enactment of Article 8 and uh, letting our local support. So you'll get a second for that. Uh, and then the president will administer the vote. So we're going to sit back and he's going to call everybody that's going to vote to sit. Some of this may be applicable to everybody, some of it not, depending on how closely y'all follow uh, uh, Robert's rules. But uh, and once that's done, it's, it's usually a hands up vote from everybody seated. Uh, once that's done, hopefully things go well. Uh, you're going to get a, the, a copy of that document to your recording secretary uh, to be recorded. Uh, so that's primarily, it's like the nuts and bolts of, of, of what needs to be done. It's not hard. Uh, and it's just, to, you know, getting people to get the courage to stand up and 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 read the document and uh bring a group of friends or, or, or supporters with them uh one thing i i, I kind of like to mention uh because i know you know a lot of people are nervous about about this kind of thing and, and it's always hard to get people to stand up in front of that microphone but uh you know imagine imagine if you had to argue the other side you know i mean a lot of people are going to be nervous but imagine if you had to get up there and, and like my president did and, and say with a straight face uh, that, that the administrative caucus is doing a good job, you know, and that there, you know, there's a few bad apples up there that, that uh, are weeded out. And, and this is a, this is a system that doesn't have problems. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it, it's taking care of itself. That's a hard sell. You know, and, and there's so much evidence against it right now. Uh, and, you know, imagine saying that, that uh, you know, it's a good idea to just sit back and do nothing. Uh, you know, the government's going to take care of it. Uh, you know, ethically, it's a terrible thing to say. 
and, and this is our union. We need to step up and do what's right. So, you know, anybody nervous about this, you know, don't be nervous because we, we kind of, we got this, right? Uh, this is all, this is us. Uh, the, the arguments are uh, uh, weak from the other side. And I would be frankly more nervous to do that. And we all know shop floor talk and, uh, you know, we got numbers on our side. We just need to make it happen. Uh, and that, that's kind of the thing, you know, now, now it's kind of a window of opportunity to get this happen. It's the first time in decades that, that we're being watched, you know, the government's involved. We don't have to, to worry so much about retaliation as far as product allocations and things like that goes. We have a, a perfect moment in time uh, right now uh, to make our voices heard and to make sure they're heard in the future. Uh, with one member, one vote. Uh, I think that covers the questions. Back to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Kenneth. That was great. Very, very uh, informative. Uh, I appreciate all the pointers that you gave. Um, so I've got a number of questions that have come in. Uh, so, you know, folks can keep sending them. Um, before, you know, we're not maybe be able to answer all of them tonight. If, if people have follow-up questions, they can, of course, uh, email it to me, chris at labornotes.org, and we can try to connect you with UAWD folks. But if they want to contact UAWD directly, how would they best do that? Uh, there's a couple of ways to do that. We have a Facebook page. Uh, and on that page, uh, I've gotten messages uh, on the page uh, asking for details. Uh, I've sent out the resolution uh, on Messenger, on Facebook Messenger. Um, we also have uh, emails that are linked to it, uh, linked to our, our uh, website. Uh, but I'm not sure that those are uh, really easily accessible. Uh, I haven't tested out the contact uh, on the website. So uh, the best way, if you're on Facebook, uh, is to um, you know send a message to our Facebook page, Unite All Workers for Democracy. That's the name of the page. Uh, alternatively, if you want to take down my, my number, I'll give you my number. You can text me, and uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, my cell phone number is 219-801-2002. So those are, those are two options for you. Perfect. Uh, so I've gotten a, a number of questions about who is eligible to vote uh, for the resolution. So one, one person asks, uh, with all the tiers, who of the membership is qualified to vote on the resolution uh, for Article 8? Another person asks, are re retirees allowed to vote for the resolution? And another person asks, I'm part of a new, newly formed union. We, we were certified, but we're bargaining our first contract now. Um, so are they uh, allowed to vote for the resolution? And I'll just field this to anybody who can answer it. Well, I'll go ahead and, and take it again. Um, uh, as far as the tiers are concerned, every local, every tier, every uh, member that's a member in good standing uh, is allowed to vote. Uh, retirees are allowed to vote at their local union meetings. Um, and and uh, as far as the new, uh, newly uh, chartered local, uh, I don't see any reason why they, you know, at their union meeting, they wouldn't be able to uh, pass the resolution as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, a number. So somebody has brought up on here that um, at their local meeting where they tried to pass the Article 8 resolution, their local president and an international staffer said that it was unconstitutional. Uh, can you, can someone respond to whether or not the Article 8 resolution, which is Article 8 of the Constitution, is constitutional? So they're implying that the Constitution is un unconstitutional. Um, I, I've, I've seen that uh, before. I understand that it happened uh, this week at one of the union meetings. Um, 
And on that, it was uh, about the uh, question of uh, um, electing new delegates, because the, the resolution does call to elect new delegates. Uh, that's in there just to highlight what is already in the Constitution. Uh, The last paragraph of Article 8, uh, Section 4 uh, says, uh, talking about this particular way of calling a special convention, uh, says, uh, in which event the vote of each local union and the election of delegates from each local union shall be the same as provided for in this article uh, for regular constitutional conventions, except that in applying section nine of this article to determine the average monthly per capita taxes paid by the local union, a 24 month period uh, concluding with the six months prior to the month in which a special convention is convened shall be used. So that tells you that their re, uh, the voting strength must be recalculated and also that they're the locals will elect new delegates. They'll use the same process that they used for the uh, Constitutional Convention. Great, thank you. And I know that uh, that information is also available on the UAWD website. Mike, would you like to say something? Yeah, um, I don't know if the, the question is, um, did, did the, the, the chair of the meeting actually say that this, uh, this motion was unconstitutional or did he say that the, um, the motion was out of order? Um, and I would challenge the, the chair of the meeting on that basis. I would simply say, and all you have to do, if you have the number of people at the meeting to do this, challenge the chair and say, I challenge, all you could do is get him and say, I challenge the chair on his ruling that it's either unconstitutional or, um, it's out of order. And once you challenge the chair on the Roberts Rules of Order, then a vote has to be taken to determine who wins that battle, right? And it usually takes a two thirds majority, if I remember correctly, to overturn a ruling of the chair. So if you have the number of people there to make that challenge, challenge the chair on those questions. And then once you win, then they have to vote on that uh, resolution or motion that's before the body. Great, thank you. That's very, very uh, insightful. Um, and I so believe I, it is just a majority, sorry to interrupt Chris, but I, I do believe it's just a majority vote to overrule the decision of the chair. Okay, all right, correct, okay. Even better. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, a number of people are asking which locals have passed this. Is, is there a way on the UAWD site for them to get that information or maybe they can in the near future? We haven't as, a, as yet posted the list of locals. We can do that. We, we have one compiled. Okay. Uh, so two questions kind of about UAWD's positions. Uh, one, um, someone says, it's very important to come out unequivocally against any federal lawsuit or takeover of the UAW, so against any government takeover. Can you make UAW's position clear on where you stand on a government takeover? And then also someone asks, um, so you're for accountability and one member, one vote and transparency, but where does UAWD stand politically on other questions? Like how do we know more about the organization's position on any number of other issues? I guess I'm, I'm uh, fielding a lot of the questions, uh, but um, so the, where do we stand on other issues? Uh, we're, we're putting together a platform uh, and ba basically our, our platform is to empower the members of the UAW uh, to take our union back. Uh, you know, the, the UAW started as a militant rank and file union uh, and we'd like to return it to, to our roots uh, as much as possible. And that means that giving the members the power in the, in the UAW. And what was the other question, Chris? Can you refresh my memory there? The position on government takeover of the union. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, our whole effort is to try and avoid 
a government takeover of our union. The uh, reforms that President Gamble has put into place so far uh, are, are wholly inade inadequate to uh, uh, do what needs to be done within our union. Um, the best reforms I can think of uh, would be to empower the members of our union to clean our, our clean up after ourselves. Uh, and that's what uh, our mission is here, is to empower the members of our union to be able to uh, hold their officers accountable when they do things that are, are uh, you know, out of line, uh, whether it be through uh, uh, contracts that we feel are, are uh, you know, you know, have been forced on us, we can hold them accountable through a one member, one vote system. Uh, when we find corruption, corrupt practices happening, uh, we can hold them accountable through a one member, one vote system. Great, thank you. Um, so a, a couple questions here um, about, there are some very large locals in the UAW, like local 600. Um, there's only two locals, it, uh, someone is saying, in the kind of larger Michigan area. Has UAWD thought about having like a mass meeting or something like that in Detroit to bring workers together to discuss these fights? Or how can people get involved? Are you organizing any, are there any plans to try to bring people together on a larger scale anytime in the near future? Sorry, Scott, I didn't mean for you to take off feel all these questions. I was having an issue with my mic here, but I can kind of speak to that. You know, being, uh, I'm actually in Michigan. Region 1D, we're in the backyard, you know, at International. Um, it's, it's been a challenge here, and I think it will continue to be a challenge because, you know, the, the, like I said, I think we talked before, I didn't talk about it in this, this webinar yet, but, the, you know, there's international presence at these, uh, at our meetings uh, where, where our section, uh, Article 8 is being brought up. Um, as far as collectively bringing something together, there's some opportunities here. I mean, I think uh, Rory Gamble is now putting out uh, a town hall um, that might be uh, somewhere where you're, we could uh, gather, share information, meet, and uh, uh, form something there, or pass out literature, or, or you know, um, set something up to make a, a presence and make, let let more people know what, what's going on. That answers the question. And I'd, I'd like to add that we are planning a, a uh, our first official meeting, our first official gathering will be uh, April 17th at the Labor Notes Conference. So I, I'd encourage members to, to uh, go to our website, join UAWD, and uh, also go to the uh, Labor Notes website and uh, you know, come out to the Labor Notes Conference and join our meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is uh, getting close to the time that we have uh, to you know uh, for this call. I appreciate everybody for joining us. You can continue to message us and contact us. So I guess I'll just go around the panel and let anybody have any parting thoughts that you might have or anything that you want to address that you think is really important. Um, so uh, Mike, you know, I'll start with you. Uh, any any last thoughts? Oh, Mike, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry. I would just like to uh, thank the uh, participants of the webinar here tonight uh, for your uh, dedication to the union and this challenge that you've taken on. I know it hasn't been easy. Uh, I've been through it myself, so I know what you're going through. Um, and if there's anything that I can do in the future to assist you, if you feel I have a role to play, uh, please get in touch with me and uh, I'll do what I can do to, uh, to help uh, your movement. But uh, the main thing is to, to stay strong, uh, stick to your convictions here. And um, if we continue to reach out to the members, I think under the circumstances, uh, you'll get a positive response from the membership. There's no doubt about that. I think someone said earlier that this is the perfect moment in time for this to happen. Uh, with all the corruption that's going on in the UAW. And, and I can tell you that uh, there are many people who were staunch supporters of the administration caucus and, and, and that system who are absolutely outraged over the level, over the fact that we have corruption in the UAW, 
and and the, uh, the 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 degree to which it has has grown. So I think you have more allies out there than you realize. Uh, some who are intimidated, you know, by the administration caucus still today, but it's reached a point where some of them, I think, are prepared to break from the administration caucus to uh, to assist any movement that makes sense, so that we can return the UAW back to the days when we were corruption free. I mean, one of the most proudest moments of working for the UAW was the fact that we could always say that we didn't have corruption in our union. You know, and so many people worked so hard for so many decades to make sure that that actually was the case. And to see what we see now today is just appalling. So thank you again for your time and effort. I really do appreciate it. And again, as I said earlier, if there's anything I can do, please reach out to me and I, I'll do as much as I possibly can. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so Scott, we'll go to you next. Well, I can tell Mike, uh, you know, I expect to be hearing from us because uh, you guys have, have uh, already tread this road and uh, we're going to be looking for uh, advice from uh, the New Directions Movement folks. Um, but, uh, you know, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, the power of the union resides in our members. And if we can't clean up our own union, then, uh, you know, we don't know what uh, government takeover is going to look like. And, and, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, unsettling to think about. Uh, so I'd rather go down this course and try and take our union back ourselves and do the work that needs to be done to uh, have a clean UAW once again. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Travis? Sorry, I had to figure out that unmute thing again. Um, I, I, I adamantly believe that there's a very real possibility of RICO. The, uh, it's, it's very clear. I think we're heading on in that direction. Right I think Travis froze up on us. Uh, so maybe we can try to come back to him in just a minute. Um, so Kenneth, we'll, we'll kick it to you and then we'll come back to Travis if he, he comes back to us. Oh, wait, Travis, you're back? Okay, sorry, oh, we lost you for just back. a minute there. Sorry. So we, we lost you at uh, RICO. Well, okay, so I, I, there's a very real possibility of RICO coming. coming. Um, all, it's, it's leading in that direction. Um, right now, uh, we have the opportunity uh, for the membership to take a stand and, and rightfully take back the member or take back the power. Um, the power has been there. It's just it's time that we collectively organize around that and uh, clean up our, our union. So um, with that, thank you guys very much for joining us and appreciate the questions and uh, uh, look forward to uh, talking to some of you. Uh, on the what uh, your website the contact on there for an email. I think that goes uh, to uh, brother Joseph Valentine. He was part of the UAWD and uh, uh, has done great work for the website. But I'm happy to help out uh, if anybody has any additional questions, concerns, or, or uh, information. Uh, my number is 616-323-8317. Uh, and uh, you, you can reach me at uh, TravisW at UAW.com as well. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Travis. And then uh, Kenneth, uh, closing us out, parting thoughts. All right, you put the pressure on me. Uh, <laughs> no, that's cool. I, I, uh, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, and uh, everybody watching and uh, all these guys and, the, and, and ladies in the, the UAWD. Uh, the, all of them fantastic people, uh, good UAW members, and uh, just want, you know, I think the direction is that we want to return the power uh, to the people on the floor, and uh, it's, it's the right way to go. Uh, we got this moment, we need to use it. Uh, if anybody has any questions or wants to talk uh, about uh, how they can do this in their local 
uh, name is Kenneth LaRue, L-A-R-E-W. Easy to find on Facebook. Uh, anybody at my local 1853 that wants to talk about the UAWD, I would love to, uh, I'd love to have some conversations. And uh, thanks, Chris, for, for having us. But uh, awesome job all around. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for joining the call tonight. Uh, there's been lots of contact information given out. Uh, so um, more information is going to be forthcoming. We're almost halfway there to getting enough of these resolutions passed. You can find a copy of the resolution at uawd.org online, um, as well as other information and resources to pass it in your own locals. It won't take much for this to pass. If um, two of the largest locals in the UAW were to pass it right now, like Local 2865 in California and Local 600, um, you would, we would basically be there. Um, so it's very possible that this could happen, and even in the short time frame that remains. Uh, so I would just encourage everybody to get involved and to contact UAWD. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a good weekend. Thank you.